what Sean thinks. I did enjoy having Debbie in the house with Sherry. That was, that was fun. Um, <laughs> no, it was a blessing to have both of them there. I owed you for first service, man. That's... But anyway. Um, yeah, we did. We got to know a lot. And, it, and, and, you know, it's true that I think the relationship is expedited some because of the fact, we, you know, being together for those four weeks and things. And, and it, was, it was a good time. I, I don't have any complaints at all, at least that I'm sharing here. So, <laughs> all right, onward. Um, hey, how, how do I get out of this? This is, uh, okay. Yeah. So, what are you thankful for? And I want you to think on that question a little bit as we, as we journey through uh, the next few things here in, in, in over the next few minutes. And uh, we're going we're gonna to just take this little journey, but as we do that, I want to share a little bit with you about um, the first Thanksgiving. Now, I'm going to take you back to your, probably your grammar school history, if you can remember that far back, then go back to your high school history. I mean, we, we, we encountered all this at some point in there about what the first Thanksgiving basically was and where it was and what it was about. But just as a, as a quick review, um, a fellow by the name of Edward Winslow recorded that first Thanksgiving event back in 1621. We have some, some pieces of writings and things from him. What we're able to tell um, from this celebration that was held, was held in Plymouth when the colonists, uh, Puritans, Pilgrims, whatever you want to call them, came over from England. They were under religious persecution there. Some different things. Church of England was kind of coming down on them. And, and so they took the opportunity to make the treacherous journey across the Atlantic um, to the New World that time. Not much was known about it at all. And, and so they landed there at Plymouth and they established a colony there. And they really didn't know much about what they were doing. They didn't know anything about the soil. They didn't know anything about uh, the, the climates and things like that. And so they befriended the Native American Indians that were there. And those, those folks showed them how to plant crops that would grow and how to take care of them so they could have a bountiful harvest. And in October of 1621, they held the first Thanksgiving feast with these Native Americans. There were 50, roughly 50 colonists present at that first Thanksgiving feast, and there were around 90 Native Americans that were present. So about 140 individuals for this, for this feast, sharing and celebrating God's blessing and bountifulness and providing the food, making the, the, the crops grow, providing the water, and, and doing all these kinds of things. Unlike today, where we have Thanksgiving feasts, it goes for one day, this feast went for three days. A long time. Well, you know, I have no clue what that looked like. I can't imagine doing a three-day Thanksgiving feast in my home. I don't know about you, after I eat a little bit of the turkey dinner, I'm done. I can't imagine doing this for three days. But they're celebrating and giving thanks to what it is that God had uh, for them. About um, 80 years later, Congress, the, the Revolutionary War had occurred, the United States is established, and Congress tries to get then President George Washington to establish a day to declare a, for a day of Thanksgiving. And what he does is he basically encourages it, but there is no formal day that's set aside. And so Thanksgiving between 1789 and 1863 happens on and off during those years. Maybe one year it'll be observed and another year it wouldn't. Maybe it'd go three years before it was observed again. So there was no, there was no regular pattern. It wasn't until 1863 that something was established. And these are the words that we read that was um, establishing what we call our Thanksgiving holiday. So it'll be up on the screen, follow along as I read this together. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. 
And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also, with humble penitence for our national perversiveness and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. President Abraham Lincoln. Proclamation of Thanksgiving, 1863. It was on that day that it began to establish a, an annual day set aside, holiday, to specifically give thanks to God as a nation. Can you imagine such a proclamation being made today with the political climate that we have, with the moral climate that we have? To set aside and say, we as a nation need to humble ourselves and repent. We as a church understand that. We as a church get that. But if that was something to be said by the president or whoever in this day and age, the ACLU would be all over it. But our forefathers recognized God's sovereign hand in everything that was going on. Those that took that first journey to this land and held that first feast recognized his sovereign hand in the success of their crops and the success of being able to live and, and, and being able to enjoy a harvest, that his hand was on it. And so it is something good and right for us to be giving thanksgiving to God. But how shall we then give thanks? If it is good and right for us to do it, how shall we do it? When shall we do it? How often should we do it? What should it look like? The Bible is full of admonitions about giving thanks to God and what that looks like. I can't go over all of those with you this morning. But I do want to go through a few and encourage you to read through the Psalms, encourage you to read through the book of Colossians, and, and there's others, but those are the ones that come to mind. They're just full of admonitions about giving thanks to God and the different ways which that can be done, the different examples. We're going to explore a few of those this morning. And so having said that, this sermon is going to be more topical in nature. It's not so much expositional, not having a Bible passage, then drawing out the lesson from that. We're taking the topic of thanksgiving, and we're going to look at what God has to say about this through his word and a few of these areas about how we need to respond, about how we need to embrace this, and, and what role is this playing in our relationship with him? Does it help it? What, what is God's intent purpose to say we need to give thanks? And so let's take this little journey and, and see, where, see where we go here. There are seven facts about giving thanks in the Bible that I find. There are more than seven, and I'm going to look at seven with you this morning. And the first one is this. That giving thanks is commanded in the scriptures. In other words, we are told to give thanks. We had our reading this morning in Psalm uh, 136 about giving thanks. It's pretty clear right there. Verses 1 through 3 and verse 26 say this. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. And then he ends up with verse 26. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. So there's two things about that psalm that you can remember. One, give thanks. And two is? There you go. You won't forget that. You can say you have one passage now semi-memorized, Psalm 136. Give thanks and his love endures forever. He tells us in Psalm 100, in verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Oftentimes you will find praise and thanks being used interchangeably in the scriptures. They basically mean the same thing. It's kind of hard to have thanksgiving to God without praising him. And it's kind of hard to praise God without thanking him. I dare you to try it. It's really tough to do that. And so the psalmist here is telling us that we need to enter his courts. When we, come into the, 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 when we come into the assembly like this and wherever we go, we need to give thanks to him and praise his name. It's because of him that we live and move and have our being is the idea here. We need to praise him for that life, that life he's given us to the full. And thank him for that. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, again, we are commanded to give thanks. Beginning at verse 15. Therefore, 
be very careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Paul is writing to, uh, to the Ephesians here, and, and he's telling them that everything that's happening around you is, is, are, are bad things, and they're evil things. And men are lovers of self, they're lovers of money, and they're boastful, and arrogant, prideful. Not a whole lot different than what we see today a lot that goes on around us in the world, people that, that are focused on, on, on the horizontal, not the vertical. But they are, they are, they are uh, making poor choices, and, 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 there, and there's evil days. And so he's saying, take the most of every opportunity that comes along. When you have an opportunity to shine God's glory, seize it. Seize that moment. And, 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 and share it, whether by word or deed. Share God's glory and, and give thanks to him in that moment. He goes on to say in verse 17, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, don't, don't rely on your own thinking and things, but... Understand what God's will is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. This is the New American Standard Version, or translation here of this. Unfortunately, the NIV translation of a little bit has a punctuation mark in there, and some people... Um, have, have interpreted Ephesians 5.20 in such a way that it, it is promoting that we should give thanks to God for evil. Nowhere in the Bible does God tell us that we are to give thanks for evil. As a matter of fact, you tell us we are a poor evil, that we are to flee from it, that we're not having anything to do with it. And so it doesn't make sense that we should be told to give thanks for evil. We are told to give thanks through evil, when we're going through an evil situation, something happened to it, we are to give thanks to God that he's carrying us through that evil time. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's not, we're not giving him thanks for the evil doing. We're giving him thanks for how he is carrying us through whatever's happening to us. Let me give you this example. Let's just suppose for whatever reason I decide I get up on top of the children's center over here and I get on this end of the peak and I run, a sprint run, just as fast as I can, and jump off of the end of the building. And it's about 15 feet or so down to the ground, and hit the ground, and I break my leg. Let's just hope that's all I break. And then I say, thank God he broke my leg. How, what would you be thinking? No, God didn't break your leg, you idiot. You did. You ran off the building, you jumped off, you made the choice to jump off the building and try to defy gravity, which didn't work out so well for you. Right? Now, I can thank God that he spared my life for my stupid choice. I can thank God that nothing worse happened. But to say that he broke my leg, that's what, that is what we have to be careful of when we look at verses like this. And he's not saying we need to give thanks for evil. The, the shooting that happened in the church in Texas. We give thanks to God for the shooter? No. We can thank God that more people weren't killed. We can thank God that some people survived. We can thank God that those people who did lose their life are with Jesus. At least there's that. As hard as those things are. But to thank him for the act. It's not consistent with his nature. And that's what Paul is saying here. Thank him for things that are consistent with who he is. For all things that are in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are commanded to give thanks to him. Along with that is our second one. Not only are we commanded in the scriptures to give thanks, but giving thanks relieves anxiousness and gets our focus on God. Giving thanks relieves our anxiousness and gets our focus on God. Philippians 4.6 tells us this in verse 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When we begin to get anxious about circumstances and things, we are focusing on the circumstances. We're focusing on a horizontal. We're focusing on what men can do to us or people can do to us. We're focusing on, on, on that that might be wise in our own eyes, trying to figure out how we're going to solve this, how we're going to take care of it. We get anxious. We get nervous. We get stressed. Because we're not looking here first. 
and seeing our circumstances through how God sees them. Pastor Sean has been teaching for the last uh, eight weeks or so on a relationship with God, a 3D relationship. How God wants to work and build a relationship through us through the, uh, through the mind, the heart, and the body. If we try to live life by looking at the horizontal and circumstances without relationship to him, we're going to fail every time. We're going to be stressed out. We're going to be anxious. We're going to be nervous. But when we do it, when we cultivate our relationship with him and we give thanks to him through this, that anxiousness goes away. That nervousness can go away. It can deliver. So we can see things in proper perspective as he sees it. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the result is the peace of God that transcends all understanding with our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 15 and 16 say it this way. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Sounds real close to Philippians 4, 6, doesn't it, in some ways? Is, as, as we let the peace of Christ rule, the word here, rule, means to, have, to be a referee. Let the, let the peace of Christ be a referee over our hearts. See, our hearts can be deceitfully wicked. Our hearts can mislead us if left to, this to themselves. Without relationship with God, if we just rely on our hearts and our feelings, we can go awry. And, and, and so nowhere in God's word does it say that, you know, throw out your emotions, throw out your feelings. Those, those are God-given. But they have to be seen in proper context and perspective. And, and, and Paul is saying here that we need to let the, the peace of Christ rule in our hearts to keep our hearts in check, to keep them in line with what God is saying to us and, and be in that relationship with him. And in doing so, we need to give thanks. And be thankful, he says. Thankful can also mean being, uh, expressing gratitude, giving thanks and having, having gratitude for something, which moves us on into the third, third one here is this. Not only are we commanded in the scriptures uh, to give thanks and, and our anxiousness will be relieved and gets our focus on God, but giving thanks can lead to an attitude of generosity, which can lead others to giving thanks to God. 2 Corinthians 9.11 says this. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This passage is where Paul is talking about giving. He's talking about giving offerings. And he says that we are to give our offerings with a thankful heart, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And it's all this conversation that is happening. And so there's an attitude of thankfulness that, that, is, that is through the, the generosity there. And as that generosity is cultivated, then that can lead, as others see it and receive that generosity, it can cultivate thanksgiving in them to God. Let me give you an example. Just uh, last week, Von Hoffs carted out 250 some odd shoeboxes. Took them over to the uh, distribution center last week. Those shoeboxes were made by who? You. And, and, we, and we made a shoebox. And it wasn't, to, to many of us, it wasn't much of a thing to do, but we, just, we did it because we wanted to. We wanted to share something with someone. We wanted to be generous. And so we made this shoebox up, and, and if you were like me, you put a little tracking label on it so you can see where it's going to go through all the year, and I haven't figured out exactly how to make that work yet. I'm still trying to get there. But it's going to be interesting to see where this works, where this ends up. But, you know, you, you, you give that little shoebox in, and, 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 and they do some things with it there at Samaritan's Purse and stuff, and that box makes its way to wherever and the child that gets that box very well could express thanksgiving to God because it's made known what spirit this is given in and that child could give thanks to God his parents or her parents could maybe give thanks to God there could be a whole family that ends up praising God and coming to Christ because of a shoebox I've heard testimonies through the years uh, many of you might remember Luba Travis who was here for a while working with our youth and stuff Luba was the recipient of a shoebox way back in the day. And that shoebox is what led her to Christ. That started that journey. She has a testimony about that. It's just incredible. It starts in an act of generosity. It leads to thanksgiving that overflows, and then it just continues. You get the picture? 
And so this, this is what Paul is saying. He goes on to say in um, back a few verses, chapters in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly, outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. He's saying, don't give up. You still continue to be thankful. Continue to share that grace and, and let that result in thanksgiving. Let it result in praise and glory to God. Let, let the name of Christ be magnified. Don't lose heart, he says. The grace will bound to more people who will give more thanks. The fourth thing I find is this, that we are to give thanks with a sincere heart. In other words, we're to mean it. When we give thanks, we're to mean what we say. Psalm chapter 9, verse 1. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all of my heart. Not just the parts I'm comfortable with. With all my heart. Colossians 3.17 tells us whatever we do, whether in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. That means be authentic. Do it all in his name. Do it real. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. So is, is this sincere thanks when I say, I'm really thankful for my church, but I'm really thankful for my friend, but I'm really thankful that Pastor Bob loves my dogs, but I wish he'd let them out more often. <laughs> yeah, you, you get the point. We need to get rid of the buts. Okay, that didn't come out right. We need to get rid of those qualifiers, the things that, that we want to put in there. I'm thankful, but you know, really, I, you're, you're really lucky I am being thankful for you. Where's the sincerity in that? I, now I'm not focused on him. I'm not concerned about him and, and thankfulness to him blessing other people. I'm concerned about what I look like this way and maybe how I'm manipulating or whatever else I'm doing on this level. I've taken God out of it. That's, that's not good. We need to get rid of the qualifiers. Again, do it sincerely with all of our heart, not just parts of it, all of our heart. Be transparent with it. Whether in word or deed, do it all to the glory of God. The fifth one, after we give thanks to the heart, is this. We are to thank God because he is worthy of our thanksgiving. I mean, you think about all the things that God has done for us and, and with us and through us and what he's going to continue to do and his promises. He's worthy. I think that one you get. You probably could have wrote that one. We thank him because he's worthy of it. Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. He is worthy. His love endures forever. There's that phrase again. And it pops up throughout the Psalms like that. Not just in Psalm 136. It's throughout the Psalms. His love endures forever. We need to remember that. That helps us to thank him in the midst of storms and trials that come along. There are consequences, however, for not being thankful. And that's the sixth area I want to look at with you. And basically, it is talked about in Romans 1, verse 21. It says this, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. In verse 18 of Romans 1, Paul begins to talk about the creation. He begins to talk about how the creation screams about God's existence. It declares the fact that God is and that he exists. We call that general revelation. It's not enough to say, but it is enough knowledge to, to, to affirm that God is real and in his hand that he is here. And that should lead us to want to have an encounter and to know more about whoever this God is 
And that would lead us to what we call special revelation, the Holy Spirit revealing the fact that God gave his son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins and die on a cross so that we might have life and have it full and live with him eternally. But at this point, he is saying that, that, that the creation has been screaming out about it so that men are without excuse. Because these men, they suppress the truth, even though it was made known and plain to them, because God made it plain to them. And for since the creation of the world, he says in verse 20, for since creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So nobody can stand up before God and say, well, I never knew you existed. I never knew there was any opportunity to even seek you. God makes it plain to every man, woman, and child on this earth through his creation that there is something more than us. There is something more behind all of this world and all that is created. There is something that screams about the fact that there is a divine being that has done this, and that is God the Father. God the Son. And God the Holy Spirit. He says that they didn't give thanks to him, nor did they glorify him, and they became darkened because their foolish hearts and their thinking became fools. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for things and thoughts and images in the form of corruptible man. So that brings up this question. What do you then what do you do when you are just at a roadblock? I mean you you're just you you know you need to thank God for something but you're just struggling with it and you can't thank him in the midst of whatever it is that you're going through. You can't thank him for just being there whatever it is. It's, and and I've known people like this. They're just so underweight, they're so under crushing uh, stress that they they just seriously can't thank him for something. They can't think about what it is to thank him for. So what do you do about that? Because we tell people, well, you need to thank God in, in all things. And they can't. We just lay guilt on them. We tell them there's a punishment if you don't. Oh, that doesn't help. What do we do with that? I think Romans 8.26 gives us a start with that. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, or groanings too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The will of God is that God is to be praised and God is to be thanked. And when you and I are at a spot where we just hit a roadblock and we just can't punch through it, we can't sincerely thank God, we can do this. We can say, Lord, help me in my unbelief. Help me in my moment of, of need here. And trust that the Spirit is going to intercede for thankfulness on our behalf. I'm not saying be lazy. I'm not saying take the easy way out. I'm saying that there are times that that's legitimate. There are times when it's just to, just to give it over to God. And as we do that, His Spirit will work on us and eventually we will break through and be able to give thanks. We'll be able to give praise. We'll be able to see our situation for what it is. We will be able to be delivered from it and rise above it no matter what it is. I'm not suggesting it's easy. But I am saying it is possible and it is provided for. God will do it. He is faithful. He will deliver us from it. Sometimes we need to carry each other to the feet of Jesus and be thankful for, on somebody else's behalf. Remember in Mark 2, there's a story about a man who was paralyzed since birth and he couldn't walk and he had to lay out there and beg all the time and, and his friends heard Jesus was coming to town and so they thought, you know, we need to get our buddy here who can't walk to Jesus because if we get him to Jesus, he's going to be healed. And so they find the house where Jesus is teaching and you probably heard the, the, read the story and heard it in Mark 2. They find the house where Jesus is teaching and, and they can't get through because the crowds and everything are all jammed up and they're trying to push you and they can't. So they get this bright idea to go, we'll go up on the roof and we'll make a hole in the roof. Can you imagine what that was like? I mean, it, you know, we, we often think this, when they make this hole, it was all neat, you know. 
doing things and nothing was, you know, nothing was happening down below. It says, Jesus is down there teaching and it says he stopped, he looked up because there was a commotion going on and there was stuff falling from the roof. I mean, imagine somebody trying to cut a hole through this roof. To, you know, if Jesus was standing here, I'm not Jesus, okay? That, that Jesus is standing here doing this and, they, and they, they, they lower somebody down to right here to be at the stage and the insulation would fall and all the sheetrock would fall and all that stuff would happen. It would not be quiet. It would draw some attention. Jesus doesn't scold. He doesn't, doesn't reprimand him, nothing. He looks at the man and he says, your sins are forgiven. I got to wonder what the four friends at the top of the roof were thinking at that point. Oh, we brought him here to walk and you're healing him the sins. Okay. And the Pharisees were looking at that and they were going, ah, who is this man that he thinks he can forgive sins for only God can do that. And Jesus said, so that you Pharisees know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he turned to the paralytic and said, get up, take up your mat and walk. And he did. How did that man get healed? How did he get his sins forgiven? It took his friends, I want, to, I want to envision it with four friends, they carried him to the feet of Jesus. They got him there. Sometimes we need to carry each other to the feet of Jesus. Whether it's one, two, or three, or four, or 20 of us, or 150 of us, we need to carry each other to the feet of Jesus sometimes. Because what we're going through has paralyzed us. And we're not, we're not able to function and have the right focus. And so we can carry each other until we can regain our legs under us and walk. That's part of what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says the body of Christ is more mature and complete and built up as each part does its work. We pull together. See, that's what a relationship with, with God does. We cultivate that relationship. We take on more of that kind of mentality that he wants us to work together and pull together and to share together and to give thanks for one another. I mean, let's be honest, as I kind of wrap this up here a little bit. Talking about giving thanks for everything that's around us. There are some people it's really hard to give thanks for, isn't it? And if you're thinking, no, you're probably the one it's hard to give thanks for. There are some people that drive me nuts. You know why they drive me nuts? Because they're different than me. If everybody was like me, the world would be a great place. <laughs> but you know what? When you see others through God's eyes all that goes away that's, a, that's somebody Christ died for that I can be thankful for be thankful even if they drive us nuts because chances are what it is is driving me nuts about them is something an area that I'm weak in it's probably an area that I need to grow in it's probably something that God has said hmm I know how to fix that in you I'll give you this person to come along and, I'm not going to say be a thorn in my side, but to cultivate me. Be thankful for that. There are several reasons to be thankful. Crazy people are one of them. People that drive us crazy, we can be thankful for them. Go ahead, you can say it. I know I drove you crazy for four weeks. There are other things that scriptures talk about, and I got these scriptures in your, in your um, outline there, and it's this, Ephesians 2.8, for the grace of God that brings salvation, excuse me, for, uh, it is by grace you've been saved through faith, I started to quote Titus 2.11 there, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for every good and perfect gift that comes from above, James 1.17 tells us that. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We all know that. one. But Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank him for eternal life. That gift. You can thank him for that. You 
can thank him for justification. Romans 5.1 talks, and, and following talks about the just, justifying work that Christ has done for us. So there is no condemnation. You can thank him for the fact that we are now more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Romans 8. You can go on and on and on. You can read the history in the Old Testament about the children of Israel, how they were delivered and things. You can see some corollaries there about how God delivers us today and thank him for that. You can thank him for friends and family and spouse and job. But we can thank him as we look up to him and give it to him. For that's what he wants. If we get our eyes on the horizontal, we get our eyes on the circumstances, it's going to drag us down, it's going to pin us down, it's going to get our eyes off Jesus, we're going to get further away from him and we're going to become bitter, we're going to become complaining, and we're going to become grumbling. And we're not going to like each other very much. But when we cultivate that relationship and we seek to serve rather than be served, great things happen when we give thanks. Great things happen. So here's your take home thought. Giving thanks should be a part of our everyday lives. When tempted to complain about something, what is there to be thankful for regarding that something? Then do it and lift it upward. Something that just it, it gnaws at you and you're like, I'm, I'm tempted to complain about that. Okay, I'm going to look at that and say, what is it that I can be thankful for in this? Something driving me crazy, all right? What is it that I can be thankful for and whatever that is that driving me crazy? Something is hurtful. I'm not suggesting that you ignore the hurt, you ignore the craziness, all that. I'm saying look at it in its proper perspective. Something hurtful. Look at it and say, okay, Lord, how, how can I be thankful through this? In spite of this hurt, how can I be thankful? And let the Spirit work in you. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and as they come, we're going to take a couple of minutes and give you time to respond to this. Inside your bulletin is a square little piece of paper. It looks like this. And if you only have one piece of paper between husbands and wives, you guys can share. Okay? But what I want you to do with this is, hopefully you've got a pen somewhere. We're going to have a time of silent prayer for about the next um, two to three minutes. Okay? It's going to be a long time. But... For you heart and body people, this is your moment, okay? You head people already had your chance. We went through everything here with the scriptures and things. Now, you heart people, we're going to be going to prayer for about two to three minutes. And then, during that time, I want you to just, just ask the Lord to show you what you can be thankful for or thank Him for something. And in the midst of that, I want you to write down one or two or however many things you want to that you're thankful for and, uh, uh, through Him on this piece of paper. Fold it up and hang on to it because then I'm going to close in prayer after about three minutes. And that's going to be our usher's signal. Then at that point, they're going to pass the offering baskets around. Fold this up and when that offering basket comes around, put this in the basket. We're going to bring them up and we're going to dump them in the basket up here at the foot of the cross because this is your thank offering to God. Psalm 50 talks about giving a thank offering to God. And it's that we give thanks to him and we don't take it back. Thank you, Lord, for this. And it's there when we mean it. And it's gone. And so it's going away. It's not coming back. And so it's going to be, it's going to be a long three minutes. But just commit it to him in total silence. Just between you and him. Meditate on that and write something out. And then I'll close. Let's pray. given us everything we need for life and godliness. And I thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to fill us and to, to lead us into your word, to reveal it. To lead us through this life, directing our paths. Keeping us on that, that way and, and, and helping us to, to forge that relationship with you to grow deeper in that, to embrace it, to be more conformed to your image, Lord Jesus. I, I thank you for that. Lord, I, I thank you for being a part 
of this body. Thank you for everyone here and the gifts that they bring and, and the, the differentness that we all bring. And Lord, I pray as we go from here this morning that we will not just relegate giving thanks to you to one day a year or even a few times here and there, but Lord, that we would make every effort to give thanks to you regularly, daily, and to be a people of thanksgiving with sincere hearts of gratitude and passing that on with generosity and watching it overflow into thanksgiving to you happening in other places as well with other people. The Lord, thank you for all that you've given to us. Thank you for for this time. Lord, we give you our offerings now, our thank offerings, as an expression of that that we are truly thankful for in you. And we lay them at the foot of the cross because it is of the cross that we can have this life and have it to the full because you have conquered death and now given us a gift that can never be taken away, being with you in eternity that indescribable gift, Lord. Thank you for that. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.